So again, formally, a very warm welcome to this, uh, this training seminar this morning on consumer duty. It's been uh, alive and with us for, uh, for a month now, just about. Um, and it does represent uh, one of the biggest changes to, uh, to legislation, to, to regulation at least, um, that I can remember. A lot of advisors who I'm talking to at the moment are saying to me, Jeremy, isn't, isn't consumer duty just simply a TCF on steroids? Um, I think not. I wish it was. Um, but it actually is a lot more far reaching than that, uh, quite fundamental. Sorry. And we will unpack that as we go through the training seminar together. I think myself, it's a Don't fundamental it on maybe. seminar and shot for trophies all at the same time. <laughs> You're okay. Yes. Um, I rang up. <clears throat> Uh, as fundamental as the uh, retail distribution review, in uh, in my view, and see what uh, see what you think when we get to the end of the uh, seminar today. So, without any further ado, then let's uh, let's get off and running. So, <clears throat> over the course of the uh, the seminar, what are we going to do? I'm just going to give you the the background, really, to what were the factors that have led us to where we are today with the new consumer duty that's been implemented. Um, just to unpack you know, what it's intended to do and in what ways it's, it's gonna benefit consumers. Then really drill down into the key components of the consumer duty and, and also the implementation deadlines too. Um, and then from, from your perspective, um, to try and get a better handle on exactly what it is the FCA are expecting of you in the advisory space. Yeah? As you know, consumer duty is kind of pan the distribution chain. So it affects manufacturers uh, as well as distributors. But we've got our own kind of uh, house that we need to, uh, to get in order to satisfy the FCA. <clears throat> and just to share with you some of the key elements that you might want to be considering in terms of being able to demonstrate, and I think that's key, key here, is the demonstration of the fact that you're complying with the consumer duty requirements. So that's kind of what's ahead for us as we, uh, as we work through. So as I said, what I wanted to do really is to start off by looking at the, uh, the background to uh, the new consumer duty. So why are we where we are? Well, <clears throat> through their supervisory, their normal supervisory work, and also through some specific consultation work that the FCA did, they identified that whilst a lot of firms, and I think particularly in, in our space, in the advisory space, have got good practice in place, there were still, in their view, too many practices in place that would, were either directly resulting in consumer harm or would potentially result in consumer harm. So they determined to do something about it. And as you would imagine, this isn't a really, this is really aligned to what they've been trying to do. If we think about initiatives such as treating customers fairly, such as uh, the work on vulnerable customers, such as the enhancement of the senior managers certification regime, we're all, this is the direction of travel we've been on for, for quite a long time now. <clears throat> so because of what they, they found, um, they said, no, it's, it's really not where we want it to be. So we're going to uh, ask for and impose much more exacting standards of conduct. Yeah, so we're going to raise the bar and we're going to ask more for both manufacturers and distributors across, the, across that, uh, that chain for anybody who works in that retail consumer space. <clears throat> and what, what will need to happen, we're all used to this now, I think, with, with all the initiatives that come through, you'll need to self-assess and report on how you're meeting consumer needs. So there'll be a lot of um, data flow uh, into the FCA. <clears throat> um, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to identify practices that don't deliver the right outcomes for consumers and take much quicker action than they've taken in the past. 
they really don't want poor outcomes to become entrenched as, as market norms. And that's what they were saying in their final guidance when you read it kind of cover to cover. And this totally aligns to their business plan. Um, they want to become much more data led. That's their one of their key objectives. And they want to become much more proactive. And that's why they're putting these mechanisms in place. <clears throat> if you haven't done so already, uh, I would heartily recommend that you re read the finalized guidance, not least because within that finalized guidance, <clears throat> there's lots of examples on what constitutes, in the FCA's view, good practice and bad practice. So again, you'll be needing to think about how you're going to implement consumer duty and you may as well take, take your frame of reference, I guess, straight from the, the horse's mouth, so to speak. So in terms of what they've actually found as part of that consultation, as part of their normal supervisory work, they're unhappy with the information that's being provided to consumers. <clears throat> now, I know a lot of the information comes from the manufacturer, but we do also handle our own information, things like suitability reports spring to mind. So <clears throat> they had evidence that there was, uh, there was uh, information being misleadingly presented. Uh, this is, these are their words, difficult for consumers to understand and would hinder a consumer's ability not only to make the right decision as to what they want to do in terms of their financial planning, but make them in a timely way. So, <clears throat> yes, you were getting the information, but you probably weren't getting at the right point of your journey. <clears throat> they also again, say in the finalised guidance, that there's evidence that there are products and services out there that aren't fit for purpose. And what they mean by that is they're not delivering the benefits that a consumer could reasonably expect. Also, where products have been sold that are not appropriate um, because those products weren't actually targeted at that sector of consumers, and also products and services that aren't providing what they uh, deem to be fair value. So that's not necessarily the advice fee, but it's all the charges that, that get onto the plans. There'll be a lot more uh, concern and focus on the cost of products and services throughout the lifetime of products going forward. Another, I think, quite fundamental change. <clears throat> and also a poor consumer service. Um, so again, back to this issue about being unable to make timely decisions, um, not being able to make appropriate use of products and services. Um, and they talk there about um, difficulty to exit or switch out of products and services, maybe exit fees, maybe just poor consumer service that so they couldn't switch in a timely way <clears throat> all of which uh, they they believe increased the the costs that consumers experience and then they also talked about some other practices that they thought might hinder consumers ability <clears throat> and i just want to talk you through these because it's their language it's a little bit flowery the first one is information symmetries. And all that means is, in the FCA's view, all the power lies with the manufacturer slash distributor in terms of knowledge and understanding and the timing and frequency and quality of information. So it's a bit of a David and Goliath situation in their view. So that's got to be readdressed. <clears throat> they also don't like um, customer inertia. And what they mean by that, the best example I can give you there is auto renewals. So, you know, some of you may be in the general market of, uh, of insurance. Auto renewals for home and motor, they don't like that at all. Um, so that's all going to go. And behavioural biases or vulnerabilities. So um, if you do a little bit of uh, consumer psychology, you understand that information or service presented in a certain way for certain people can look more attractive than maybe it should. 
or maybe with vulnerable customers, it, there, there could be an argument that they're easier to influence and, uh, and then potentially exploit. So uh, again, we'll need to be, be able to demonstrate the FCA across that distribution chain, manufacturer and distributor, that we are not uh, following any practices that might cause uh, consumers those, those issues. So if, if that was the kind of brief history lesson and uh, some of the findings, let's have a look at the, uh, the response that the FCA have now come up with. <clears throat> so what they're basically saying is that uh, this new consumer duty, as I say, all chain, all firms across the distribution chain that provide products and services to retail customers are impacted by this. <clears throat> Very clearly, the intention is to see a much higher level of consumer protection and improve the standard of care. Yeah, so I think consumers, are, I think I would, I would challenge that they're relatively well protected at the moment anyway. But I do think the, that the focus is much more on improving the standard of care throughout their consumer journey too. So not just uh, pre and and at the point of sale, but also post-sale throughout the life cycle of their products and services. Uh, and make no mistake, this is about trying to drive cultural change. And we'll see later on in the seminar how you know the, the intent to hold leaders to account for this. They see it as much as a cultural change as a process and systems change. And of course, it's all about trying to instill consumer trust, still trying to build uh, that, that trust. Whenever we, we try and measure it with uh, consumers, as we know, we're always kind of disappointed because it only takes one or two things, not necessarily in our space, but the global kind of retail financial services space. And unfortunately, we all get tarred with the same brush, which plays out in, in poor perception from consumers so in a nutshell <clears throat> they just want good products and services at fair prices high standards of service and clear communications and i say well that's kind of what we all want too so we're we're professional uh, advisors that's why we get out of bed in the morning to, to to provide that kind of service to our clients <clears throat> So what they, want to, what they want to do by that is to say, right, so let's increase confidence, consumer confidence that the products and services that I'm participating in are actually helping me achieve my financial goals. And I can, uh, I can understand why that is, because the information that I've got is very clear and pitched uh, right, right in the zone, really. <clears throat> if I want to make any... Uh, changes then i won't be hindered in any way so there'll be no unnecessary barriers so if i want to switch if i want to change providers whatever i want to do no uh, unnecessary penalties for doing that and of course a great standard of service throughout the journey i know i keep banging this drum but when you read the guide you're seeing that they want a impeccable standard of service not just from, from us in our space, in the advice space, but also from the providers. And I think they've got a lot of work to do here in terms of being able to support consumers throughout the, uh, the life cycle of their particular journey. So who's in scope then of, uh, of the duty? Basically, anybody who's a retail customer who, who might be covered by the relevant FCA handbooks, whether it's in the COP space, whether it's wealth, whether it's uh, general or pure protection, whether it's mortgages, all, all consumers are in from that perspective. And if you uh, work in the consumer credit space at all, then this duty also applies to all regulated credit activities as well. <clears throat> As you might expect, duty will also apply when we're getting ready to do some sort of financial promotion. So for those of you who do your own financial promotions, you'll have to have a think about, I know you get them approved anyway, but making sure now that they're approved uh, 
uh, and fit for purpose from a consumer duty point of view. <clears throat> when you're dealing with queries from consumers, um, whether they're not actually a client yet, but they, you know, they're at a prospect stage before they've actually made a commitment to a product or service. And <clears throat> when you decide, as you're in perfectly entitled to do, to decline a product or service, whether that be a distributor or whether it be actually a product manufacturer. So whenever this, we say no, it has to be uh, stamped with the uh, seal of approval in terms of consumer duty. Now, the thing when you read the guidance that underpins this new consumer duty is the concept of reasonableness. <clears throat> and you might be sitting there thinking, well, where's, where has this come from? Um, it's the FCA describe it as, uh, as, as being akin to a legal concept. So it reflects a legal concept of how reasonable and prudent firms would act. And it's one that they believe firms are already familiar with under the common law. And I guess is that there's a, there's a good argument for saying that's true because outside of the, the normal compliance that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's uh, COPS, ICOPS, whatever, uh, we've also got things like uh, complying with money laundering, with data protection, et cetera, et cetera, which are all based in common law. So we do understand, I, I guess, the concept of, of reasonableness. But of course, it is a concept, so it will be subjective and it will need to be interpreted. So you'll have to interpret this for your own business and say, when I make changes or when I enhance my systems and processes, when I move to the consumer duty regime fully, is what I'm doing reasonable? Does it pass the reasonable test? Um, would the regulator think it's reasonable? If it went to the ombudsman, would it be reasonable? Okay, so we, we have to use judgment and discretion throughout your considerations with this, this new duty. <clears throat> and I think, you know, inevitably, because we, uh, we work with consumers, it's a, it's a contact sport, you know, it's, it's not outside the, uh, the bounds of reasonableness that going forward, the FOSS, maybe even the courts will play a role in shaping consumer duty because of that. <clears throat> so some of the factors that might affect reasonableness include, you know, what we're actually offering the client, you know, what's the product, what's the service? Is there any significant risk of harm in terms of what we're doing? Um, and that's probably uh, wrapped up within the complexity of it. Yeah, so how complex is it? You know, if, if it all went wrong and had to be wound, what's, what's the risk there to the consumer? What about the charges? You know, do they pass the, the sniff test in terms of being reasonable? Yeah. <clears throat> and what are the, the characteristics of both the consumer and firms? You know, <clears throat> are they sophisticated? Is it, are they high end, you know, wealth management, people who know what they're doing? Are they novices who might be more vulnerable? And where do you sit within the distribution chain? What's your role in the provision of the product or service? So <clears throat> you're never going to get a definitive list and you're never going to get a black and white in terms of what consumer duty may look like for your particular firm. But if you remember the concept of reasonableness, I call it when I'm working with my advisors, the sniff test, uh, you're not going to go far wrong with that. And there's some, some, again, good examples of what good and what bad looks like in that final guidance. <clears throat> but, you know, consumer duty cannot ever uh, fully protect somebody. So it's not designed to actually remove consumers' responsibility for making their own decisions. Now, at the end of the day, they will have to take decisions themselves. We can't make the decisions for them. We just have to provide them with the right quality of information at the right time and provide them with simple, straightforward explanations and advice. <clears throat> it also doesn't mean that every consumer is going to get the same terms for a product or the same outcome in terms of the service that they're going to get. And the FCA, although sometimes it doesn't feel like it, do uh, accept that we can't protect everybody from everything all of the time. So this is a, a big step forward. 
to reduce to increase in protection and increase in service uh, levels but we can't protect everybody from everything <clears throat> and there'll still be the need for specific rules and guidance you know so the the handbooks aren't going anywhere and indeed the principles of business aren't going anywhere uh, they've simply added consumer duty so we've now got il uh, 12 rather than 11 all the others still have to be adhered to and i think we're very used to that because we're, we're working with a principles-based regulator they never tell us specifically how we need to act within our firms we, we kind of figure that out for ourselves and i think reassuringly what they've what they've committed to is to say look we're not going to go back there's going to be no sort of uh, witch hunt here this is a new initiative um we're not going to ping you for something that's happening today ahead of the formal implementation now we're not going to look back and say you should have been doing it like this back in november 2022 uh, because it's not not implemented yet <clears throat> so whilst i'm talking about implementation let me just give you a reminder. By now, you should have agreed on an implementation, I should say, plan. Uh, <clears throat> you may be thinking, oh, I, I might want to get on a plane and fly away from all of this. It's an implementation plan. Uh, spring next year, uh, what you will find is that all the providers, the manufacturers, will have to come with, to you with information that you need to be able to comply with consumer duty. And that's why the implementation of it was actually pushed back to July next year, because the, the manufacturers kind of squealed and said, oh, we, we ain't gonna be able to do that in a hurry. Um, so can you give us some time to get that information together and make sure that we can get that out to distributors? Um, so you're gonna get information on, you know, what the product is aimed at, the targets, the target markets. They're going to do a value assessments on them. So as you can see, they've got quite an onerous amount of work to do here to be able to enable you to comply with um, your responsibilities for consumer duty. So full compliance for all new products and services, which uh, which either stay on sale or, or remain open for renewal has to take place by the 31st of July next year. <clears throat> Where companies are running closed books, they've been given an additional year to, uh, to, to run the data, produce the numbers on closed books. <clears throat> and for those of you who, uh, who have a, a board structure, uh, and if you don't, you'll have, a, you'll have a management structure, you will have to do a report for the first time uh, one calendar year after implementation, so 2024. And I'll talk more about expectations of board and governing bodies uh, later on in the seminar. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's move on now then to start to consider the key components of consumer duty. We've looked at where it's come from. We've looked at what the stated intentions of it We've seen it's underpinned by the concept of reasonableness, <clears throat> and we're now going to drill down deeper into consumer duty itself. <clears throat> so the first thing, and I'm sure you know this from, from your reading, is this, this principle, which when you read it for the first time, looks a bit innocuous, really. It's, you know, of course, we want to act to deliver good outcomes for, for retail consumers. You know, who wouldn't want to do that? <clears throat> But we're going to unpack this in some detail in a minute. And as you see, I'll go back to my opening comments. This is not TCF on steroids. It's a fundamental shift. <clears throat> Underneath the principle, we've got three cross-cutting rules. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. They're not actually rules when you get under the bonnet. They're the how, really. This is what the FCA is expecting of you in terms of delivering consumer duty. So it's about acting in good faith towards consumers. A really interesting one about avoiding foreseeable harm. And uh, we'll, again, we'll unpack all of these and to see some, some of the things we could do to evidence that we're doing all of them. And 
to enable and support retail consumers to pursue their financial objectives. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, that's my day job. That's what I kind of do. Yes, it is. But going forward, you'll find that you'll need to do an awful lot more of demonstrating to the regulator that's what you're doing and how you're doing that throughout the life cycle of the product or service that you're providing. <clears throat> and then we get down into more of the kind of uh, nitty gritty, the four outcomes, products and services, price and value, the biggie, I think, consumer understanding and consumer support. So we're going to unpack each of those in turn now. Let's start off with this new overarching principle, principle 12. So it's been brought into the uh, business principles. And it is very clearly a step up in expectations. Yeah. When you get into the new principles, we'll do in a tick, you'll see that it sets much more exacting standards than are required under existing print six, which is TCF, and also principle seven, which is all about clear, fair, and not misleading information. Yeah. <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, they are retaining the existing handbook and materials linked to principles six and seven. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll talk more about that in a tick. So where principle 12 applies, and I would suggest in the majority of the cases, it's definitely going to apply, it effectively replaces principles six and seven. What it requires you to do is to proactively seek to deliver good outcomes for clients and to put their interests at the heart of your activities. Now, what I'd like to do is to just emphasize, you need to be able to demonstrate this. So you think about how am I going to evidence everything that I'm doing is the right thing for the right people? And how am I going to evidence that things like the culture within the business are put in, you know, decision making is put in their interests at the heart of everything I do? It also requires, again, you to demonstrate that there's a focus on the outcomes that, that the consumers get. And it actually is based in, on, in reality. So how the consumers actually transact in the real world, how do they actually behave? So this is one of the shifts I think we're going to see, particularly at manufacturer level. They're going to need to get a lot more information and evidence on the real world and real consumers and how they choose to transact, how they behave at point of sale, point of advice. So there'll be, I think, much more two-way communication. They'll either go direct to consumers or they'll come to you. Uh, and I think there'll probably be a mix of, of both so that they can get a better handle on how things are really happening. And you'll be invaluable for that because that's your kind of day job. <clears throat> they want consumers to uh, be able to access and assess information in order to pursue their financial objectives. And again, you, when you read down into this principle, this is all about not just what you provide, but when you provide it to them as well in terms of their, their journey. Yeah. So how easy would it be for somebody to understand this information? Have they got it in the uh, at the right time? Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have sufficient understanding? Can you demonstrate sufficient understanding of consumer behaviour, how the products and services are actually working? Can you demonstrate that the outcomes, you know, that would reasonably be expected are actually being achieved by consumers? And if you think about our world, particularly those of you who work in the wealth space, about those annual servicing reviews where we're reviewing objectives versus uh, outcomes, are they getting what could reasonably have been expected? Yeah. <clears throat> where we identify that that isn't the case, we're not getting the right uh, or good outcomes, what's actually going to be done then? So can you demonstrate that you're taking proactive action to address this? Have you got systems and processes in place, A, to identify and B, to tackle the problems 
that are leading to uh, poor outcomes. And that is about, uh, I'd say, at least an annual audit on yourself, but consistently challenging to make sure everything that you do is compatible with consumers' interests and their financial objectives. <clears throat> so principle six and seven remain, yeah? Principle 12 effectively uh, takes precedence to them. So what it's saying is if you simply comply with six and seven, you won't have complied with principle 12. Yeah, six and seven are just the baseline, really. 12 actually takes it up. And I think that's probably where uh, this commentary about being a TCF on steroids maybe originated from, from that. But it is a lot more than TCF on steroids. This is about evidential demonstration that you are consistently considering consumers, that the heart of your business thinking, decision making, that you're delivering consistently good outcomes that could be reasonably expected. And, and if and when that's not occurring, then proactively we're taking actions to, uh, to address that. So quite a chunky new, new principle. So to, to try and drill down a little bit more into that, we've said it's about putting consumers' interests at the heart of your business, but also working with manufacturers to make sure that any products and services that are provided are fully meeting consumers' needs. They're providing fair value. So it's not necessarily the cheapest, it's fair value. That they're meeting or helping to achieve consumers' objectives and they're not actually causing them any harm. And harm would be, as I say, ability to, uh, to switch, swap, that kind of thing. <clears throat> There's also a massive expectation on communication. <clears throat> and I know I keep talking about this, but it is a, it's a fundamental uh, point of this new duty. So are communications effective? Are they timely? Would they enable a consumer to make a properly informed decision about a product or, or service? Yeah. <clears throat> Would it enable them to understand it sufficiently that they feel empowered to take responsibility for actions, for decisions. <clears throat> can you, can everybody within the distribution chain demonstrate that we're consistently meeting consumers' needs and we understand how they behave at every stage of the product and service life cycle? So, you know, this could be a 40 year commitment for somebody taking out a pension or something like that. We have to stay with them throughout. Are we demonstrating an ability to learn from um, our understanding of real consumer outcomes? So how do people actually behave, actually transact? And do we build that into our products and services? <clears throat> Do we support consumers in realizing the benefits of the products and services? So this is a getting away from just uh, sell them something and, and go. Yeah. So how do we stay with them? So again, if you're in the mortgage market, and I know a lot of you will do this at the moment, but when that deal is coming to an end, how proactive are you in getting back in there and looking for the next one for them? How are they able to move, swap? change providers without there being any unreasonable barriers you know, are they manufacturers are going to have to look at things like penalty charges mcvs to to see if they pass the sniff test of reasonableness and again are uh, making sure that we're not uh, doing anything even inadvertently that might be playing into behavioral biases or exploiting consumers that may be showing characteristics of vulnerability so that's uh, that's the principle uh, at a high level and, and some expectations beneath that. The cross-cutting rules, as I said, not really rules. They're more, I was describing rules as, as a framework, really. They're just about amplifying the standards of conduct. Um, <clears throat> so they are quite simply, that firms must act in good faith towards retail customers. As we've said, avoid foreseeable harm and enable and support 
retail consumers to pursue their financial objectives. <clears throat> so building on what we do already, you know, honesty, open and fair dealing, I think that's kind of well baked in to, to, to our space at the, mo at the moment. Uh, and they apply to all stages. And again, it's, they keep banging this drum about across the life cycle of products and services. <clears throat> and they keep banging the drum, even in the cross-cutting rules about how you're using the knowledge that you've got and how a manufacturer is using that to, uh, to support them in making good decisions throughout the life cycle of the product. Okay, so let's, Let's again drill down into each of these uh, these cross cutting rules now. Rules now then. So acting in good faith, honesty, open, honesty, open, fair dealing, all that kind of good stuff. <clears throat> Especially relevant product design stage. So as I say, this will become more and more important to manufacturers their product design piece. Um, and I think uh, you'll become much more important to them on a consultancy basis, really, for feeding into their products uh, and their service design so that you know there's uh, more alignment from manufacturer into distribution this is one that you could really say uh, spills over or is is core to to culture really so as i said in my earlier comments this isn't about new rules and regulations per se this is about fundamental cultural shift yeah <clears throat> So we shouldn't be exporting uh, biases. So, you know, we've got to be careful about how we uh, present things to people to make sure that, of course, we want to influence them. I understand that. I'm of the real world. We would have to advise and get them to buy to make money, but we have to do it on a, a level playing field. Um, again, this is about an alignment piece to say we shouldn't be selling them something that's not totally aligned with their financial objectives. And I know that doesn't affect you on this call. This is a this is a pan regulation thing. Remember, there's still lots of evidence of consumers being sold things that really they either don't want or don't need or won't actually do the job they think it's going to do. <clears throat> and again, Building on this cultural piece, it's around not using either performance management or uh, bonus schemes to, uh, to, to drive sales that might cause detriment to, to consumers. So a big screen about that in the, in the finalised guidance. Again, probably impacts more at manufacturer level uh, and restricted sales level. The second cross-cutting rule is about avoiding foreseeable harm. Uh, so this always causes uh, a good debate because you know, we don't get out of bed wanting our, our clients to come to any harm with their products and services. So what do, what do the regulator actually mean by this? Well, as I've already said, it's about <clears throat> you can't, they can't see how they can either cancel a service or a product because they process is unnecessarily complicated and you know i've i've been um working on something with with somebody where it's been necessary to contact insurance companies and they're they're call centers you know I, you're on the phone for an hour aren't you i'm sure you find the same in your day-to-day -day kind of work if you want to get something out of a, of a manufacturer you could be sitting on the phone listening to some pipe music for well over an hour before you even start to talk to somebody so that's what they mean about you know this has got to be sorted out that is not acceptable under consumer duty <clears throat> neither is the cons consumers uh, being charged too much frankly because they don't understand the charging structure so again there's going to be an awful lot of emphasis on lifetime value of products. So it won't just be looking at things like your initial fees and ongoing fees. It will also look at the, um, the manufacturer's costs, you know, of, of um, producing and maintaining the product as well. And they'll look at total lifetime value. Uh, that will be the new kind of um, computation that they'll be interested in. And it's also, uh, they're also asking us to do more to educate consumers about risks so they don't fall victim to uh, phishing 
expeditions to scams because they weren't sure enough. Yeah. <clears throat> and it all is about uh, being proactive here in, in thinking through what are the situations, what are the biases that may lead consumers to, to harm. We know we can't protect them all from everything, but is this something that we could have reasonably foreseen that we could actually put right? <clears throat> the third cross-cutting rule, straightforward, I think this one, this is about enabling them to fulfill their financial objectives. Focus very much on communication. Do, do, we, um, do we know that they fully understand the products and services that they've decided to go with? Have we provided them with all the information they need at the right time? And do we, do we continue to do that so that they can achieve their financial goals? So again, at a manufacturer level, this is about designing products and services that are really simple and straightforward that most people could reasonably be expected to understand and that you could reasonably uh, explain to them because they, they're not full of uh, bells and whistles and bear traps. Yeah. <clears throat> are we sure that there's no unreasonable exit fees that could discourage people from getting better deals elsewhere? And what the regulator is looking for, and I know a lot of you have got these uh, processes in place at the moment, but if a consumer requires a product or service that you're unable to fulfill, have you got a slick mechanism for referring them on to third parties so they can get holistic uh, advice? <clears throat> so those were the three cross-cutting rules. As I say, when you sort of drill down into the less rules, more of a, of a framework, behaviour, the how we're going to implement this new principle 12. <clears throat> which leads us nicely into the four new outcomes then. So the four outcomes do provide us with more detailed guidance. Um, and they, these are the rules that will be used to assess your interactions and relationships with consumers. So what are they? So in the same way, we'll, we'll get the headlines up and then we'll go and unpack each of them. So products and services, price and value, consumer understanding and consumer support. <clears throat> Let's start off then with products and services. So again, just to help position this, I've pulled some of the pulled extracts out of that finalised guidance. So in terms of products and services, the FCA are actually saying in this guidance, they want products to be designed to meet consumers' needs and also targeted at those consumers. So both Manufacturers will need to be much clearer about who these products and services are targeted at. And so will you. And that's why you'll be waiting for that, uh, that data to come through in, in April. <clears throat> they want all products and services to be fit for purpose. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, I think, thought they were. But again, remember that research, they found that there's still, still some products and services out there that they thought weren't fit for the purpose for which they were being marketed. <clears throat> the expectation is by setting these much higher standards, that they want to uh, provoke, I think, uh, better uh, competition or more competition and a higher level of innovation in the marketplace. Yeah, going right back to, uh, to what their objectives are, clear products at a fair price. <clears throat> and they are realistic in terms of they understand that whilst these rules will be applied and both you and manufacturers will be judged against the products and services outcome, then one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, so some products will be uh, very simple and straightforward and uh, probably represent little or no risk to consumer harm. Others will be much more complex. So it's, you know, horses for courses really so in terms of the products and services outcome what do we actually need to do to demonstrate that we're, we're doing that 
So we'll, we'll need to demonstrate that the products that we are uh, advising are not fit for purpose. So we'll be waiting with basic breath for that key information to, to come in. <clears throat> to demonstrate they're designed to meet the needs, characteristics and objectives within that consumer target market that they're aimed at. So you'll get information from the manufacturers that say this product is aimed at this target market. Yeah. And it will meet the needs and objectives of consumers in that target market. So we suggest that's who you, you, you sell it to. <clears throat> because they should only be specifically targeted at those consumers in that segment who have that particular need. And that the distribution strategy is appropriate for the target market. So that will just really depend on the different business models that, uh, that you run. Some, you know, run telephony, some run just next, some are more face-to-face -face advice. Your distribution strategy needs to be aligned to the target markets targeted at consumers who have defined needs. And the distribution strategy, again, needs to be aligned to that. <clears throat> and it can't be set in aspect. What needs to happen is on a regular basis, we need to be reviewing both products and services and saying, does that still hit the spot? based on remember these real world interactions the behaviors what real consumers are doing do we still believe that product and or service is relevant to the target market does it meet the objectives has something changed has there been you know changing the budget or whatever that might impact that <clears throat> so what might you want to be thinking about at this stage well you might want to be thinking about your own particular service propositions, how you articulate those to uh, prospects and current clients. Uh, you'll probably be wanting to think about some client back segmentation and you'll be at different stages, I guess, of uh, maturity in terms of how you approach that. And um, think about how financial well-being is promoted and plays into your service offer because that's kind of what consumer duty is is all about so moving on to the the next app from price and value so <clears throat> this isn't uh, about making products just as cheap as possible for everybody the, the fca are much more realistic than that but what they're saying is that um, you know we want you to, to provide fair value, but not at the expense of other factors. So don't uh, chop everything out of products because it makes them cheaper. We want good products at a fair price, not necessarily at the cheapest price. <clears throat> so it needs to be considered in, in, the, in the round. So it's not always about low prices. It's about, could we reasonably uh, explain what we're getting for our money here. So why am I paying this? The consumer says, I'm quite happy to pay this because these are the benefits I see it provides for me. Then it passes the price and value test. <clears throat> what it doesn't uh, want to see, again, from the guidance, is either complex or opaque uh, practices that uh, might discourage consumers from shopping around. So how, how can they measure company A versus company B on a level playing field. It's, it's much more tricky if uh, fees and charges aren't upfront and, uh, and explicit. So they'll be looking for evidence of that. <clears throat> and yeah, a bit of a catch all really. They just want all consumers to receive fair value. And I know that's what, that's what we want too, you know. So in terms of, of that, just drilling down into it a bit more. As we've said, it's more than just price. It's about the relationship between the cost of a product and service and the overall benefits that consumers are receiving in return for that. In order to assess that value, what you what we'll need to do is to say, right, so what's the product or service I'm providing? What are the benefits that will be provided or could reasonably expect it? And what's the quality? of that benefit too. So how holistic is it? How future-proofed is it? <clears throat> are there any limitations that are part of the product or service? So yeah, it's good value, but because it's limited in this way. Um, and what's the total expected price 
This is the big change for me that consumers will pay. So that's fees, charges over the lifetime of the relationship. So we'll, we'll need to be thinking about that more and more. As I say, potentially with a pension sale, that could be a 40 year commitment. And we'll need to be thinking about, does that represent fair value over that length of time? And it should also consider how different groups of customers uh, are affected. Yeah, some may be more at risk of harm. Consumers with characteristics of vulnerability may be more susceptible to receiving poor value. So as you can see, as, I, as I'm talking here, there's lots of interplay in between vulnerable clients and consumer duty. Yeah, it's, it's obviously still high in the FCA's thinking, certainly key in their business plan. So what sorts of things should we be thinking about then? Um, you know, if we're in the wealth space and we're charging fixed percentage fees of funds under management, both initial and renewal, why can we justify that? Why is that the case? Um, or should we move to a um, individual pricing structure? I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying these are things you need to be thinking of and uh, to be able to articulate back if, if asked to pass the reasonable test. <clears throat> Do consumers with larger funds pay more than consumers with smaller funds, even though the cost of, of uh, providing services is broadly similar? Yeah. So, you know, the likes of the Hargreaves Lansdowne model, where they have uh, differentiating levels of ongoing charges based on uh, funds under management, they'll be needing to look at that uh, hard and long to see if that is uh, still going to be acceptable. <clears throat> so you might want to just have a think about your charging structure and, and say to yourself, OK, so can we justify ourselves to ourselves, to our clients, the regulator, that the charges are reasonable? How are we going to evidence that they're fair, particularly between different consumer segments? You know, so you may have a holistic business that works in wealth, you might have mortgage, you might do general as well. So you've got different segments. Uh, how can we uh, pass that test of saying our, our, our fees and charges are fair? <clears throat> I think that the biggie, though, is the consumer understanding outcome. Because I think instinctively we're all doing a lot of that already. But with consumer understanding, it actually says in the guidance that this it actually goes further than print seven. So it requires much more of a the laser like focus really on consumer outcomes throughout the consumer journey. So I think, you know, Prince Seven was all about being open, honest, fair, not misleading, all that. And I think to a, to a large extent, we're, we're quite good at that at, at point of sale. It needs to keep going is, is kind of the rub. <clears throat> so we'll need to think about our overall approach to communication um to information so the, the the test will be have they had the right information in a way that they could understand it at the right time and in what way are we able to evidence that so that they can make properly informed decisions yeah so we're all gonna have to kind of revisit uh our information giving <clears throat> and it's, it's saying here that, you know, they're expecting you to um, actually review, monitor, test, adapt communications uh, and, and continually make sure that they're as effective as they can be as things change. <clears throat> so, as I said, it's about making informed decisions. It's about making sure they've got information they can understand in a timely way. It's about ensuring that you are tailoring communications taking into account consumer characteristics so <clears throat> i won't talk more about vulnerable customers let's just talk about a more uh, generic example around suitability reports you know <clears throat> consider use of generic paragraphs versus uh, tailored paragraphs in what way you know could we make that could we enhance it to make it even more tailored than it is at the moment yeah. <clears throat> Does it take account of the communication channel being used? I know a lot of you probably have got a web presence uh, and, you know, what's the what's the communication look like on that? What about um, telephone contact? 
what's communication look like there? And then again, the face-to-face -face stuff, whether we do it virtually now as we're doing this morning or whether we're actually sitting with, uh, with our clients. <clears throat> and this for me is, is another subtle change that's going there, but it's, it's a big one too. You know, we bombard our clients, I know, with uh, all the different documents we're required to do by the, uh, by the FCA, but we need to consider fully our role as an information provider. So it's not just about giving them information, it's about making sure that the information we give them is relevant and they fully understand it as well. <clears throat> so what do we need to think about here? Well, we need to audit basically our communications, uh, make sure that uh, they're fit for purpose and we can demonstrate, and that's the key again, demonstrate their support in understanding and good outcomes for consumers. Yeah, <clears throat> And when we're interacting with consumers, how do we tailor those communications to meet their information needs? And again, how do we demonstrate that that's what we're doing day in, day out on a regular basis? <clears throat> and as I say, thinking about things such as suitability reports and making them easier to navigate, trying to minimize as wherever possible generic paragraphs. The consumer support outcome kind of, for me, pulls the other three outcomes together. So it's, it's about saying what we want to do here from the guidance, FCA, provide support that supports their needs throughout their life journey with the, with the firm. They're desperately keen for consumers to realize benefits of products and services and to make sure they're supported throughout their life cycle to make sure that they're going to get the product outcomes they could have reasonably expected. And that, again, for me, will be a, the big change, this post-sale support demonstration of that. <clears throat> Consumers can only pursue objectives where a firm supports them in using the products and services. So they're basically telling you, you know, you need to provide that level of support there. <clears throat> a product or service that can't, uh, that can't be uh, of use is unlikely to be of fair value. So in terms of uh, customer support, as I said, it's about uh, making sure that our support meets the needs of all customers, it's tailored appropriately, that we our pricing strategy says that, you know, these products uh, do what they say on the, on the tin, um, they don't particularly disadvantage any groups. <clears throat> We've got inbuilt checkpoints into consumer journeys to try and de-risk what's happening, um, to try and identify any other options if that is applicable that may, because uh, circumstances, markets have changed, maybe de-risk them. <clears throat> to make sure that throughout, and again, this is throughout the life cycle, that there's no unreasonable barriers to change. Yeah, could be cost, could be service, could be that they don't understand that they can actually do it, yeah? <clears throat> so what will, what will everybody need to do? Uh, it'd be a case of continually monitoring the quality of the support we're offering, um, identifying if, if necessary e yeah, evidence that we may have fallen short and, and just putting that right, you know? Not saying that we're always gonna get everything A-OK -okay from, from day one, I think regulators are more than happy if you uh, find something wrong and then proactively seek to, to correct it. So what's considered as acting reasonably in terms of ongoing support is likely to depend on whether ongoing advice has been provided. Yeah, so, you know, again, for those of you who, who charge ongoing fees, you need to have a real good think about if asked the exam question, what is the consumer getting in return for that? You've got a good, strong, robust answer. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong at all with, with that. I'm a big believer in that, in ongoing fees. You just need to be able to demonstrate they're getting good value. Yeah, so it's about building, uh, you know, an, an evidence base really to be able to do that. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've we've looked at the consumer duty in its entirety, really. So we've looked at the overarching principle 
and we've drilled down into that to say this is this is a biggie it's a new principle in its own right that kind of builds on and supersedes uh both uh six and seven we looked at the uh, cross-cutting rules and we said rather than rules it's a bit of a misnomer they're the, the behaviors the how you're expected to be implementing consumer duty and then we've been into the four outcomes and gone into a little bit more depth because that's where they're going to be looking to measure you in the guidance there's also some additional requirements that, that they talk very specifically to as well so again i just wanted to uh, to go through these with you this morning as well so the first would be around culture governance and accountability yeah <clears throat> as i've already said what the FCA's expectation here is, is that consumer duty is absolutely uh, core to the culture and purpose of firms and for evidence that's embedded throughout the organisation. So, again, not just us here in our advisory space, but manufacturers as well will have to demonstrate that every decision that they make around products and services and ongoing service levels are around putting consumer duty at the heart of them. <clears throat> so all firms need to make sure that things like their strategies that they employ, their governance, leadership and people policies. We talked a little bit about how we can fall foul of not having the right incentives in place. Yeah, so you need to make sure everything is aligned to good consumer outcomes. What they're also looking for is a consumer duty champion to be appointed. Um, and again, this will depend very much on the structure of your firm. Um, they either want somebody to be a, a board level consumer duty champion or somebody to have access to the board to be the voice of the consumer from this perspective. <clears throat> And they're going to put senior managers on the hook. Surprise, surprise. As I said in my kind of opening comments, really, this is very much continuation of the, uh, the regulatory agenda. So senior managers and certification regime has been amended. Uh, consumer duty now for part of the, uh, the conduct rules for which senior managers will be held accountable. And uh, at least one senior manager will need to have that included in their statement of responsibilities as well. In terms of monitoring outcomes, as, as we've seen, you know, there's, there's an intention to move to being data led. Um, to be data led, you know, the FCA need data. Um, so what they're saying is they, they are, the expectation is for much more monitoring of outcomes, particularly from a consumer duty point of view. So could you evidence that you are assessing, testing, understanding and evidencing the outcomes that consumers are receiving. So not just you in isolation, but the manufacturers sector as well. <clears throat> so what it will require us all to do is to say, right, I need to monitor and review kind of generically the outcomes consumers are experiencing in the real world. How are the products and services uh, delivering outcomes? Are they consistent with consumer duty? <clears throat> if we're not, for whatever reason, why so we need to be able to do you know a root cause analysis really and say these are the reasons why uh, we're not getting the good outcomes that could reasonably expected of consumers and we need to feed that back if necessary to manufacturers and do we have the right processes in place to make sure that products and services can be quickly adapted um, the policies or practices are in place to address risks uh, mitigate risks and more importantly to stop them actually uh, happening again <clears throat> then i mentioned it at, at the, uh, the start i said that the first time you'll have to do this is actually in 2024 uh, following implementation in 2023 but they are expecting to see an annual board assessment now again this will depend on the structure of your firm if you sit as a board fine that just goes part of the normal board process if you don't have a, a, a formal board of directors, then it should be you know, what the equivalent kind of senior management regime is there. And what you'll be expected to do is to review using the monitoring outcomes data um, 
uh, and feedback from real consumers with real life uh, experiences, <clears throat> how well you and your firm are delivering good consumer outcomes. So the assessment should include a range of different things, such as <clears throat> what the results that you've, uh, you've undertaken to, to make that initial assessment. So let's have a look at what we found or what do we have, what do we look at and what have we found as a result of that? Are they delivering uh, in expectations? <clears throat> if we've found any evidence of poor outcomes, uh, why is that? And also be much more specific maybe than we've been used to in the past, to be able to say, to differentiate between different consumer segments, different target markets. So are some segments getting worse outcomes than other groups? If so, why? <clears throat> so you will need to do quite fundamental, I think, impact and root cause analysis uh, and look to take actions to address those issues. Yeah, <clears throat> And then to try and frame systems and, proceed and processes that you know, are working and say, great, uh, these will deliver consistent good outcomes and we need to continue to build on those. So <clears throat> out with the, just the, uh, the formal principle, there's some other requirements as well, all uh, detailed in the financial and uh, the final guidance. So I've talked about evidence and monitoring and how important it's, uh, it's, it's becoming. Um, so I know that you already do a lot of, uh, of this in terms of uh, capturing MI. But what you'll need to do is to, is to make sure that what you're capturing actually will give you the full picture against consumer duty. So it's measuring uh, outcomes, not just satisfaction uh, of inputs and, or transactional data. You'll need some specific measures around uh, what good consumer outcomes look like. <clears throat> but again, the guidance does say that the MI will necessarily need to vary dependent on basically your business model. So how big is your business, how big is your client base, what markets do you choose to, uh, to work in? Yeah. And also they've recognized that, you know, the advisory space, the distribution space and the manufacturing space are different. So, you know, they'll expect, I would imagine, really big data suites uh, from manufacturers um probably less onerous for us be more building on what we currently do to evidence things like tcf uh, vulnerable customers etc just to make it a little bit more holistic <clears throat> and again if you look in the guidance uh, it does uh, provide you with a long but nevertheless helpful suggestion uh, list of suggested mi <clears throat> And again, at that annual board meeting, what you have to do is to um, review and approve uh, the, the report that's been provided to you in terms of containing this MI and signing it off, basically. So as I've already said, first report due in a couple of years' time. <clears throat> so I'm not going to take you through all the, uh, all the data, but I just picked out some, some of the key ones. So I'm going to go just at a very high level. So <clears throat> expected prices have already said that for the lifetime of the product and across the distribution chain as well. So manufacturing costs, distribution costs as well would be something that we'll need to know and understand. They're also saying that uh, profitability data could be good, including you know uh, revenues, uh, gross uh, and net profits, and what sort of profit margins are being made on different products. And I think this is where some manufacturers will be swallowing quite hard at the moment, thinking about some of the uh, the plans that uh, I used to uh, to sell back in the days. Um, how many uh, consumer complaints and what those complaints are about and really getting underneath that with a root cause analysis because they, uh, they want to understand better what's causing complaints. I think there'll be a massive explosion in terms of consumer feedback. Uh, you see this, you'll see this, I think, talking to some contacts I've got in, in, in manufacturers. Uh, they're talking about things like doing much more um, workshopping with consumers, doing surveys, 
uh, net promoter, I think, will come to the fore, focus groups, mystery shopping. They'll want to build quite a plethora of information on, on consumer feedback to link it back to uh, product uh, design uh, and then making sure that they're fit for purpose throughout the lifetime of consumers. I'll go I'll go clockwise here as if on a, a clock dial. So the next one's behavioral insights. So again, they'll be looking at things like uh, retention rates. They'll be looking at um, product A versus product B, where the variations in products and services, uh, what are real consumers in real situations doing? Are they drawn to A and not to B? And why is that? What's actually happening? I think, again, uh, the next one, feedback. I think you're, what you'll find is you, you'll be talking to each other more with your kind of networks within the IFA space. You may be reaching out into the uh, restricted sector as well, but it'll also be much more uh, dialogue, two-way flows of information from um, the manufacturers to, to you in terms of obviously that that value piece and that product and service piece uh, throughout the lifetime of the uh, of the journey um, things like operational data uh, obviously that's just building what we've already got compliance tnc service levels that kind of good stuff <clears throat> and then the final one is all about market conditions you know we're, we're living through fairly turbulent times at the moment so you know we need to take account of the financial environment and the market environment in which we're uh, operating in terms of uh, thinking how that impacts uh, on consumer behavior, consumer outcomes, and thereby the data. <clears throat> so in terms of implementation, uh, then, as I've said already, but it bears repeating, we have got to proactively demonstrate and evidence that we are delivering on the concept of consumer duty. So the easy way, the short answer to, to remember this is everything we do, every decision we make needs to demonstrate that the consumer is at the center of everything we do. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, uh, much as you would have loved to have come on this workshop this morning, and I'm sure and get a definitive, nobody can give you a definitive because it's principles based. And even the regulator is saying there's no one size fits all solution. Yeah. So it will really depend. There'll be obviously differences between manufacturers and distribution, but within distribution, it will, it will depend very largely on your current business model and what works for you as a business and what works for you primarily in terms of giving that great service, put evidence in that, and demonstrating that. <clears throat> it's also about making sure you can evidence not just you've got great products and services slick processes and systems but the culture of the business is all around delivering good consumer outcomes so yeah you've got to make judgment calls you've got to exercise your discretion yeah so think about where you sit in the distribution chain think about your business model yeah <clears throat> For some of you, it will be more straightforward than, than others. What markets do you choose to serve at the moment? Are you staying with those markets? And then you'll need to go the next level. Yeah. So within that chosen market, who are my target consumer segments? Because remember, we'll need to be able to demonstrate that we are targeting consumers with the right products and services at the right time. Yeah, and it will need you to to, uh, to review your kind of client bank again if you've not done so already to start to think about how you're going to segment your clients. Yeah, uh, and uh, how you're going to uh, demonstrate that you're providing them with uh, fair value, good outcomes they could reasonably expect on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> so. To come to a, a summary then, so consumer duty, what you'll need to do is consider the needs of all customers, uh, all clients, their characteristics, their objectives, and how they'll behave at every stage of their journey, pre, at, and post sale. Everything needs to be considered. <clears throat> 
You obviously need to strive to consistently deliver good consumer outcomes. And I know that's what you do at the moment. I'm not saying you don't, but be able to demonstrate evidence that we've ratcheted up to this new regime. <clears throat> and we'll need to be able to evidence that these outcomes are being met. That's absolutely critical, I think. So at a manufacturing level, they'll need to satisfy the regulator that they are designing products that are fit for purpose for the target segments in the target markets for consumers. Um, you'll need to demonstrate that you've advised the right people at the right time. And we've done everything we can working together to avoid causing any foreseeable harm to consumers. <clears throat> so think about your individual interactions with the uh, with your clients, how they work, what they're likely to be, how you handle initial and your ongoing service delivery. Again, have a think about your fees, your charging structures. Do they pass the reasonable test? Do they pass the value for money test? Remember, it doesn't have to be the cheapest. You just have to demonstrate offers good value for money over the lifetime of the plan. <clears throat> And I can't stress strongly enough the need for you to, uh, to read the FCA's finalised guidance because it, uh, it, it basically spells out in, in black and white for you there that you have to have processes to identify, handle and monitor vulnerable customers. As I say, what I found particularly useful is they've got quite a lot of examples, pages of examples indeed, of what constitutes good practice and what constitutes bad practice as a start of the 10 in terms of auditing where you are now compared to where you need to be it's a great kind of starting point also don't forget the invaluable resources that you've got available to you as ifac members uh, i know uh, kirsty's put together a brilliant guide on consumer duty which i've also read cover to cover uh, it's brilliant. So if you've not done so already, I very strongly recommend that you go on and do that. Um, there's also, you should all already have put your implementation plan in place. The deadline was the 31st of October. If for whatever reason you haven't done that yet, there is an auto report writer for consumer duty on the back system that you can access in the normal way, which will produce that plan for you. <clears throat> and also um, IFAC will require you to uh, to go on and pass a uh, simple multi-choice test to test your understanding of consumer duty. Uh, and that's something that we all need to do from a regulatory perspective. So as uh, senior managers on the call, uh, you'll need to do that. Don't forget that the, um, code of conduct regs have changed as well. So you need to think about the way in which you cascade this information down to all staff within the business and to make sure you can evidence that they've got a good understanding of what's required under consumer duty as well. Good, so at the start of the workshop, some hour and 20 minutes ago, I uh, set, put up a, a set of learning objectives which I just want to, uh, to revisit now. So I said we'd explore the factors that led to the introduction of new consumer duty. And I think we, we looked at the background uh, as to what had led the FCA to come to this conclusion. Um, we've really unpacked what consumer duty is intended to do and said this is the expectation of how it's going to benefit consumers. And we then went into some detail about what the key components of consumer duty are and considered the implementation deadlines as well. And then went into even greater level in terms of trying to bring to life both what the FCA said and what their expectations are of all firms for this new consumer duty principle. Yeah. So, and then the latter part of the seminar just tried to understand the key elements that you should consider in order to demonstrate that that's the key thing that you are complying with consumer duty requirements. <clears throat> so I hope you found that, uh, that useful. As you see, it isn't a one size fits all. It will require your judgment and discretion. Um, hey, we've been here before. 
with TCF, with vulnerable customers, with uh, senior managers regime. We'll get there again. Um, for those of you who would uh, like a uh, CPD certificate for your attendance today, uh, that's no problem at all. So uh, I'm just pausing for you to scribble that email address down or for you to take a, a screenshot or photograph of, of that. And as I say, for today and for this year, that, uh, that is the, the training. I hope you found that uh, useful and thought provoking in equal measure. Um, have a brilliant uh, end to the year and I will look forward to, uh, to seeing you all at some point in the new year when we go through another programme of training. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very kind. Uh, and nice to see some familiar faces again. Look forward to seeing you next year. Have a brilliant end to the year and see you soon. Cheers for now.